So last time we talked about the British Columbia provincial election, it was a day after election day, and we still didn't know who was actually going to win the election because there were several ridings that were practically tied and we had a lot more mail-in ballots left to count. Originally, our mail-in ballot number was 49,000. This includes both mail-in ballots as well as provisional ballots. Some people go directly to returning officers' offices and just you know writing up their ballot right there. That's totally fine, obviously, uh, but that's a minority of the 49,000. But since we reported that, now the amount of ballots that has to be counted has gone from 49,000 to 65,000. I believe it's actually 66,000 at the official count that was released yesterday. It's nothing to be concerned about that the ballot number went up. Really, it's just that there are a lot of very rural areas in BC where ballots were being turned in, which were in fact picked up and postmarked on October 19th. But obviously, if you pick up ballots in, you know, Haida Gwaii or somewhere else, it will take you a little while to be able to actually send them to a BC elections depot so that they can be counted. The good thing is that the ballots are actually leaning towards the Conservatives. But before I get to that number in terms of where the ballots are probably going to be leaning in terms of the vote count, I just want to show you the ridings where there is high amounts of mail-in ballots and where they could actually make the difference. Because there is totally a chance that the Conservatives either gain a minority government or a majority government. In fact, I actually think it's probably a greater than 50% chance that the Conservatives flip at least one seat here, considering one of them is currently tied and probably leaning a bit Conservative. But before I do that, I will say, hey, if you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe to the channel. 75% of people watching my videos usually are not subscribed, so make sure to subscribe, like, share this video, all that good stuff. And if you want to support the channel, you can donate to the Give, Send, Go link for the legal fund in the description below or pinned at the top of the comments. We have a Chinese billionaire developer suing us over a fake case of defamation. And in almost three years, he hasn't actually presented any evidence. We defamed him and it still cost me $33,000. Anyways, so the riding that really matters right here is Juan de Fuca Malahat. This is the closest riding in this provincial election. It is within 20 votes. I think it's 20 or 23, depending on which count you look at. And there were 496 ballots here to count from the category of certi uh, certification envelopes containing mail-in and assisted telephone votes. The telephone votes are the things that are concerning to me, at least in the long run in terms of politics. I don't know how you administer a telephone vote, and I do hope that they counted how many were specifically telephone votes in a more detailed breakdown, because I think there is a very good legal case to say that telephone voting should not be real. There's no way of verifying the person is actually the person who they say they are. They could just take somebody else's ID in the household and vote for them. Uh, there's no way of knowing. I would like to see if there's recordings, voice recordings of the people voting, because it would be a bit odd if you like call up someone who is a woman and it's a man's voice saying, yes, I'd like to vote for the BCNDP or whatever. Could also go the other way, obviously. Uh, but the problem is when elections are coming down to who has a bigger ground game team and the NDP had an $8 million advantage, you're going to have a lot more activists willing to go out and find votes for the NDP than the conservatives. But then there is another 185 votes that are certification envelopes containing special and absentee ballots. That would be uh, people going and voting maybe through the military or going and voting uh, at offices directly because again in a lot of rural areas you have an electoral district office in your area but not an advanced voting location but it effectively acts the same way so there are 681 votes left to count in juan de fuca malahat there's a few other places that are going to matter a lot courtney comox is uh that that's actually an area where the conservatives are leading by about 186 votes or so but there are 996 votes left to count so that white might be a nail biter too and a potential flip for the uh, NDP. But another place that matters a lot is, if I can find it, it's always sometimes hard to find right away. Um, it's on the next page. Coquitlam Burke Mountain. The, uh, the NDP lead this riding 
by around 208 votes or something like that, 227 votes, there are 711 votes left to count. And even though that is a bigger gap to overcome than in other ridings, the good thing is that it has such a massive rural area after the Coquitlam area in the Burke Mountain side of that riding that I'm actually pretty hopeful that a lot of those votes will be coming for the conservative simply because they are coming from remote areas where obviously people who work in farming and, uh, you know, farming and trades tend to vote conservative heavily. But the other one that's actually extremely close, the second closest riding in the entire election is Surrey City Center. And there are a total of 476 votes left to count, definitely on the lower end of the mail-in votes, but the NDP in that riding only leads by 96 votes. And so, yes, the Conservative would have to win the next mail-in tranches by a large margin in order to come up be over to overcome that gap. But considering the fact that that uh, we had Surrey as a kind of a late-breaking type of a uh, big surge area for the Conservatives, it could happen. But again, mostly just comes down to Juan de Fuca Malahat. And the reason I'm generally pretty confident that we will be able to at least grab one of these ridings, and we're probably not going to have any of the conservative ridings flip, is that this was the last poll that Main Street conducted, Main Street Research conducted, of 2,064 people. And they were asking people their likelihood to vote, and certain to vote category, this was people who had not yet voted, and they were saying whether or not they want to show up. So the conservatives led that by a little bit, the NDP are a bit behind. Uh, and, but this was, because it was the last poll, obviously a lot of people had already voted in advance. And so the NDP always had a slight lead over early voting advance polls. It depended on the day. Sometimes the conservatives could lead the NDP. It depended, usually the NDP led by a couple of points. But on voted by mail, I oddly enough, despite many people having a bias towards the idea that the people voting by mail would be more likely to be NDP, the conservatives actually led in this poll 47.3 to 39%. I've seen it a little bit lower than that. I've seen it much higher than that. And that, if that holds with Juan de Fuca Malahat, they would, the conservatives would quite easily win that riding. On top of that, Juan de Fuca Malahat, if you know the riding, is on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. It has a lot of rural area, and there is a naval base near that area. And despite the naval base not being directly in the riding, most uh, most sailors who own homes on Vancouver Island live in towns like Souk outside of Victoria rather than paying for extremely expensive Victoria real estate. And from the people in the Navy I've talked to since this theory about the Navy playing a big role in this riding potentially, a lot of them have said, oh yeah, every single person I know in the Navy voted for the Conservatives. So if we can get this one extra riding, it at least becomes a 46-45 scenario with the Conservatives and the NDP. Yes, there are two green MLAs, and they could technically just throw this thing over to the NDP still. But I think that at least the Conservatives leading a minority government would probably ensure, or even if the NDP had to form a coalition, it'd probably ensure that we're going to have another election in at least one year's time or so, because nobody is going to want to govern in this very tight manner. And at that point, it will be a much, much easier election for the BC Conservatives to win because they get the actual taxpayer funding that the Greens and the NDP had. Remember that in the last election, there was a rule that you got $2 or about, I think it's like 187 per vote you got in the last election given to you every single year. The Conservatives only got 2% of the vote. So obviously they didn't get that much money. And on top of that, there was a rule that if you could score more than 10% of the vote in any given riding, you were given back 50% of your campaign spending funds. So going into this election, the Conservatives only had about $200,000 from taxpayers. And I think we should just get rid of these rules. Just have legitimately uh, legitimate ways of actually fundraising publicly. Because the problem right now is that you can only donate $1,400 which I know that's a lot for an average person, but it means that there's really no such thing as a very big donor. Other provinces, you can donate 3,000, 4,000. I know federally, it's still only 1,700, but at least federally, you have a far wider net to cast. Whereas in BC, there's not that many people who are going to max at a donation. And then if you can't get like 
a thousand people to max you at a donation, it's going to be very difficult to actually be able to fundraise for a provincial wide election campaign. Uh, so the so the the conservatives ended up to having two hundred thousand taxpayer dollars, and the BC NDP had eight million. So they had a seven point eight million dollar advantage. The BC Greens had far more money than the BC Conservatives had because they had like. 18% of the vote last election, or maybe like 15 or so. And then they won a few ridings and they were above 10% in several of them. So even the Greens were better funded than the Conservatives. And the BC NDP have still basically lost this election. Even if they pulled a majority, it's not really a win. But if the Conservatives grab up one more riding, they effectively won the election and they did it with five bucks and a ham sandwich. Ugh. It's so annoying to then see people in the aftermath saying, oh, well, if this or that didn't happen, it would have been a BC NDP wipeout. You guys were already given every advantage you could get. And then I was hearing people like whining about, well, if the NDP or, the, if, or there wasn't this stupid rule or if there's this, there's wasn't this uh, like instance or whatever, you know, if uh, the mainstream media co uh, co uh, commented more on the crazy candidates the conservatives were running, then the BC NDP would have won. Sure, guys. Sure. Everyone thinks that they're like, even though I throughout the entire election, I never saw any of those stories smearing conservative candidates actually move the needle because people really didn't care because most people mostly care about their cap taxes, crime, their kids and a few other issues. And, mo and it never really runs into, oh, I care that someone made a joke five years ago on Twitter. Anyways. So that should be it for me today, guys. I'm going to come back with another update later. Based on the way that the 66,000 votes split, I think there is a very good chance that the Conservatives can win. But never say never. And I think that some of these writings probably will just end up in court because of things like telephone voting if they stay extremely close. Who could really say that they won if it's only separated by like 50 votes? and like 300 people voted by telephone, and we have no way of actually knowing if they wanted to vote that way, or it's just or it's just simply people being called up and asked if they want to vote. I heard that that was a thing, that people were being called and told, you haven't voted yet, would you like to vote? And you're like, you're not supposed to reach out and call somebody. They can go find out if there's a way of voting by telephone or send out notifications. If you're telling people and texting people, you can vote by telephone. That's not real. That's now soliciting votes, especially depending on how you do it. It might be completely like uh, out of whack with like th thinking about it this way. BC elections is far a lot more likely to have NDP voters data than BC conservative people's data because BC conservative voters are uniquely disproportionately new voters because they haven't voted in past elections because the options were BC liberals or BC NDP. Oh, okay mini rant right right there about telephone voting. It really should just be maybe one or two days of voting. There should be one advanced poll day and there should be one day on election day to vote. And that's it. And I think those two days should be pretty close together because I don't like this idea that someone's voting 15 days before the actual election has fully wrapped up. Anyways, okay, that's it for me. See you guys later.